Hello, my name's Nick Bilbra and I'm the founder and the coordinator of the Hands Up Project Educational Charity. At the end of the webinar that you're about to watch, Sahar, a teacher educator in Hebron, occupied Palestine, speaks about the value of our work in the Hands Up Project, but she also gives an impassioned and heartfelt plea to the international community to take immediate action against the human catastrophe and the attack on education currently unfolding in Gaza and all over occupied Palestine. Gaza is not the same place that it was a year ago when we undertook this research. The partner organization involved in the research, the Islamic University has been bombed and as of the time of speaking, we do not know how many of the schools that the Hands Up Project worked with have been bombed, and we do not know how many of the children and teachers involved in this work have been killed. All of us in the Hands Up Project, that's trustees and our many volunteers all around the world, stand in solidarity with the people of Palestine at this desperate, catastrophic time. And we urge the international community to call for an immediate and permanent ceasefire to bring an end to this human tragedy. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share some slides, the activities that we did. So first, a little bit about the context. So this is the governmental schools in Gaza. We worked with girls' schools and boys' schools. In a typical governmental school, there would be 50 students in a class, very cramped conditions, not much move, not much space to move around. Limited electricity might possibly be only electricity for a few hours a day. So they probably don't have a generator in a governmental school. And there would be a course book, which is English for Palestine, published by Macmillan, and a blackboard and chalk, but very little else in the way of resources. There's a boys' school. So the age that we worked with was 13-year-old boys. That's grade eight. And we just wanted to, I just wanted to have a little look at the course book that was used in the that was used in the sessions. So the sessions that we did were in the normal classes they weren't extracurricular sessions they were in the they were timetabled classes and they were working with english for palestine so i just wanted to have a little look at english for palestine english for palestine is a local course book and it's organized broadly around communicative principles so it includes activities like this lots of pair work activities where the students interact were supposed to interact and to use the language of the course book to activate the language of the course, the, the target language of the course book. I think there are several problems with that type of activity, or I think most teachers from our research and from talking to supervisors and education specialists in the governmental schools, most teachers in those types of schools would skip such an activity. And I think there's three possible reasons for that. One, is it motivating for students to do such activities with people who live in the same context as they do and who they've known all their lives? So they're talking about personal things, daily routine, that kind of thing, possibly not interesting for them to talk about it with people who are in the same context as they are. Um, also, in closed pairs, so in a class of 50, 25 pairs working together at the same time to do a task like that? Are they being challenged at a suitable level in order to learn from the activity? Also, in such a cramped classroom, um, it's almost impossible for the teacher to be able to monitor the pairs as they're doing the activities, to go around and monitor and to support those pairs by correcting or scaffolding what's going on and for let and to in order to do needs analysis in order to see how the students are coping with the activity so here are my we decided to do 
this intervention for those reasons, really, to try and interculturalize the language of the course book. So here are my co-teachers, Wafa and Hussam. And each week, we, at the end of each week, we talk together about what we would do in the online link-ups that were happening in the, in the following week. Andre's going to talk a little bit more about how the research was conducted. But I'll just say at this stage that we did one class, one 40-minute session of our five out of five per week was an online link-up where the whole class linked to me for 40 minutes and we did activities related to the course book. So we worked with three units and in our weekly planning meetings, we talked about what we could do in the following week's session. So we wanted to make sure that the activities could be done by students at home. They could be done outside of class time. Preparation for the activities could be done in the student's own time. We didn't want to use up the class time with them preparing what they were going to say in the online connections. And we wanted to make sure it provided an opportunity to activate the language of the relevant unit from English for Palestine. So it wasn't a kind of extracurricular fun activity. It was something that was grounded in the curriculum um, of English for Palestine. We wanted them to be enjoyable things to do. And we wanted them to be a balance of controlled language practice, practicing specific areas of language that were in the course book, but also that the activities would lend themselves to spontaneous interaction and chat between me and, and the students. The first unit we looked at was called How to Get Healthy. And I'll just quickly go through some of the activities we did so one thing we did was I talked to them. I showed them some pictures of my very healthy lifestyle and they commented on them and we discussed how healthy this might be. And then that was a kind of model for them to do the same activity. So in the next week, they brought along pictures of their lifestyle. So here's a girl called Farah and she's talking about her daily exercise routine that she does every day after school. Um, another activity we did was we asked the students to prepare stories about either an unhealthy or a healthy lifestyle. And then they kept, they took it in turns to come up to the webcam and talk to me. And I tried to physicalize their stories for them. I acted out the stories. I made a complete fool of myself, in other words. Another activity we did, there was a strong language focus on giving advice in the course book. So we asked the students to prepare advice dialogues where one student would give advice to the other one. And then they took it in turns to perform the dialogues to me at the front of the class. And I gave them feedback on their acting ability. And I, we actually awarded prizes for the best acted conversation. And then we also linked to other young people around the world. So we took, we met very briefly, just at the beginning of one of the sessions, we talked to young people in Bosnia, excuse me, Germany, Romania, and Spain, and they asked each other questions about their healthy or unhealthy lifestyles. There was a strong grammatical focus on the present perfect continuous. So we did an activity where I told them it's a classic ELT activity. I showed them three sentences about myself, two of which were true and one which was false. And they asked me questions to try and work out which was the false sentence. And then that served as a model for the students to go home and prepare their own sentences about that topic. And I had to guess which one was true, uh, sorry, which one was false. Um, and we did it as a kind of game competition between me versus the whole class. Um, so the next unit was is called People and Games. And in that unit, we were lucky because the World Cup, the 2022 World Cup was actually happening at the same time. So we had lots of discussions about which teams everyone was supporting. And we also did what has become a classic hands up project activity which we call students versus teachers 
So in this activity, to model it, I prepared some questions about sports and games around the world. And then I asked them the questions and they discussed them in groups and they appointed a representative to come up and try and answer the question. Incidentally, Mohammed here is a student who didn't say a single thing in class until I start I asked this question about chess. And he was a very he was very proud of his ability to play chess and he knew the answer to this, obviously. And this was the only time he'd ever interacted in the whole of the in in, in all the two months of sessions that we did. So that was a model for them to do the same activity. And I'd like to just play you a video of this short extract. So what the students have done is they've gone home and prepared questions on the topic of sport and games for me to answer. And we did it as a kind of game. So they took it in turns to come up to the webcam, ask me their questions. If I got, the que if I got it right, I scored a point for my team. If I got it wrong, their team all scored a point. The whole of the class scored a point. So I'd just like to play to you that part, and then we'll pass on to Andre, who's going to look at how this was researched. Hello, Nick. Hello. Hello. How are you? Fine, thanks. Great. My name's Asma. Asma. Hi, Asma. Really nice to see you. Okay. Who is the best European girl tennis player in 2022? Who is the best European girl tennis player in 2022? Who is the best Arabian, was it? Arabian, did you say? Yes. Who is the best Arabian tennis player in 2002? Ooh, okay. Tell me the options. One, Rani Alwani. Two, yeah. Farid Osman. Three, Ons Gaber. Uh, I think it's Rania Omani. No, one. No? Okay. Who was it then? Ons Gaber. On Shaba, which country? Which she's country? From, she's from Tunisia. Ah, from Tunisia. Is she still playing now? Yes. Is she very good? She's very good. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Great. Excellent question. Excellent question. Well done. Well done. Hello. How are you? Fine. 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 Brilliant. My name's Ra. Ra. Go on then, Ra. Give me your question. Okay. Is it easy or difficult? What is the traditional Palestinian game for girls? What is the traditional Palestinian game for girls? What is the traditional Palestinian game for girls? That's a really good question. Number one, Idris. Or number two, Aram Al Golim. Uh, number three, Sukar Bukar. <laughs> <laughs> Can you say them all again? Can you say them again? Okay. Idris or Aram Al Golim. Or uh, Sukar Bukar. Sukar Hukka. Sukar Bukar. I'm going to say soccer hocker because I like the sound of it. Yes. Is it right? Soccer hocker. What is soccer hocker? What is it? Come back. Come back. What what is soccer hocker? No. Soccer hocker, what is it? Ah, okay. Wow. 
That's a game that you play in schools in Palestine. Yeah, like in the break, you play this. Yes, yes, yes. Wow, and who plays it? Okay. Hello, Nick. So there we have um, some of the activities that we did. I'm going to hand over to Andre now, who's going to talk about the research. But why is that slide? Ah, okay. Are you there, Andre? Yeah, hiya, thanks a lot. Yeah, I think you're gonna have to do a lot of clicking because I put each okay. bit separately. But yeah, okay, so now we're on to the kind of meat of the question for me is this is all very well, but what effect does it actually have on the students? Now, before we get into the too deep into it, I'm aware that in the audience, we might be slightly split in terms of there's people with um, much more of a research background and perhaps people with a lot less. So there's some kind of technical details in here, which I'm going to try and hit as much as I can, but hopefully this should be accessible for, for people without as much of a research background as well. So please forgive me if I'm if you find this tedious, I'm going over things you already know, um, although hope, hopefully that won't happen too much. Um, so first, if you could just go on, I think I'm, I'm, I'm actually not a re an ELT researcher. Typically, I, I do work as a researcher. I've done lots of stuff in the voluntary sector and now I work in the health system. And looking from the outside in, it really looks like ELT is very qualitatively dominated, I would say, for, as, as a perspective. I'm, I'm very happy to be told in the questions that I've got it completely wrong. So I thought it might be worth just quickly touching on why would we even want to use quantitative methods and why did we want to use that for this type of research? So just quickly, I think there's some really nice features that you get from quantitative methods you don't get from qualitative. And I want to be clear that everything that I say here is going to be a generalization. There's going to be exceptions where there's quantitative methods that don't do this, and you can find me a qualitative method that does do it, but as a kind of general picture. So firstly, I think a really nice thing about quant methods is that you get to include the experience of all the students that you're studying. Typically, if you were do, to do qualitative um, research, let's say you, you wouldn't be able to interview 350 students. And even if you were to interview 350 students, the methods of analysis typically don't tend to try and aggregate all of them so that their voices all count for the same. The, me the methods of analysis, like thematic analysis, whatever you choose, tend to emphasize kind of conceptual depth, which is really valuable and important, but doesn't have this nice property of weighting every student's experience, like specifically identically, which I think is really nice. If you could just go on. Secondly, maybe you want to research mechanisms that the students and teachers themselves don't have good insight into, right? So typically in the qualitative sphere, if the students and teachers don't experience something themselves, then they can't tell you about it, right? Whereas in quant methods, that's not necessarily, that's less likely to be the case. If we could go on. And finally, qualitative methods give you so much depth as applied to the people that you studied, but it becomes really difficult to generalize to other people, especially in a kind of like principled way where you know how well you can generalize to other people and how well you maybe can't. And then finally, there's a reason which I probably should have removed from it, but maybe you're like me. The world is uncertain. Everything is uncertain. And at the very least, we can cling on to, I can have some precision and mathematical precision about exactly how uncertain I am. That for me is some small comfort in this sea of uncertainty, right? So that's something that I cling to. You probably don't care about that, right, all of you watching. But anyway, so with that said, let's talk about the specific methods that we actually used here today. So as has already been touched on, the intervention, there was eight sessions, which happened once a week. So this replaced the normal class. So normally students would have five classes per week, each one 40 minutes. Um, and in the intervention group, one of those 40 minute classes was replaced by a hands up project session. Um, so if we, if you just go on, Dad. So if we look at the sample, there's uh, eight classes in total, four classes of boys, four classes of girls. So half of each of those. So the four classes of boys were all in the same school and had the same teacher. And half of them were in the control group, right? So half of them just continued with their classes as normal. So that's two classes of boys and two classes of bo boys replaced one of their classes with with a hands-up project session. And the same in the girls, right? So the total number of students across all in the whole analysis was like, I can't remember what it was, it was well over 350 students, um, which is a very large sample size, and obviously you have this clustering by class. Um, so in terms of the outcomes that we're interested in, so all the outcomes were measured at the beginning before they took part in that hands up project and at the end after they took part in the hands up project, both for the control and for the experimental group. And the outcomes that we're interested in were, so we, we, might as, we measured their test scores, 
test scores really wasn't a, a, a major priority of this research, just because the nature of the tests that they did were really not focused on communication at all, where the intervention was very kind of communi communication oriented. But nevertheless, the data was freely available. And it, there's reasons why we might care about that as well, which I'll get on to. And then we had these three kind of it, the these three outcomes, which for, for us were the real kind of meat um, of this, which is the student's confidence when studying, when speaking English, their enjoyment of English classes generally, not just at the hands-up project sessions, and their conception of English as a whole. Now, we had this kind of idea going into it that you could place students on this kind of spectrum where at one end, students think, where maybe students think that um, English is just about maybe getting a job or doing well on your exams. Um, it's something that happens in lessons and is measured by tests. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have this conception of English as this vibrant, exciting way of communicating with people in the world. And it's not about how you do on the test. It's about how it's about your ability to actually communicate with someone where you need to communicate with them. Right. And we thought that we would be able to measure if they changed along that spectrum. And finally, I'm not going to talk about it that much today, but obviously a big one is just literally their ability to actually communicate in English. We've collected some data related to that. I'm happy to answer questions on it in the question or in the panel discussion, but we haven't like fully done the analysis on that yet. So I can't say anything on what the results were there. Yeah. So firstly, let's just hit the test scores. So as I said, they, what we have here on this graph is, so obviously the analysis is a little bit more complicated than this, but roughly speaking, what we, what we have here is, so on the left, we have two columns, which is associated with the girls. The white column is the control, is the girls in the control group. And the orange column is the girls in the hands up group. And we're along the Y axis, which is the vertical line, we can see how much they, they changed in their test score. So as you can see for the girls, both the control and the hands up groups, both of them increased from the beginning towards the end, right? However, it looks like the, or the orange column is very slightly higher than the white column, suggesting that the girls improved by more than the girl than the hands up girls improved by more than the control group girls did, right? Then if we look at the boys, both of them decreased actually, which is interesting. But again, we have a similar pattern where the hands up boys decreased by less than the control group boys. However, actually, if you look at this as a whole, the difference between the two groups was incredibly small. If you average across them as a whole, the difference between the hands up group was less was better than that of the control group, but by less than a single percentage point. So that's less than 1% over the whole period. So in a way, and actually, what, if we were to do more formal statistics on it, this is, we can't distinguish this from just an, a null effect, this could easily just be zero effect. So in a way, that's disappointing, it didn't improve test scores. But on the other hand, it wasn't aimed directly at improving test scores, particularly over the eight week period. And also, you could be worried that actually, we're taking time away from classes focused on tests, to spend it on this kind of communication activities, when the tests aren't focused on that at all. And if anything, their test scores improved. Probably it had basically zero effect, but certainly the data we collected say there's no evidence to suggest that moving one of their classes from traditional classes to the hands up project sessions impaired their test scores in any way at all. So that at least has allayed some concerns, right? Although this wasn't our primary research focus. Yeah, so now I want to get onto the next three outcomes of interest. So we have enjoyment, confidence, and their conception of English as a whole. Now, all of these are complicated things to measure in that we have this kind of latent or unobservable state, right? How much does a student enjoy English? You, there's no like objective number that you can just directly observe their, their enjoyment of English as a whole in the same way that you can with a test score, right? So the kind of paradigm that we use for this comes from something called confirmatory factor analysis, which comes under the umbrella of structural equation modeling, right, where basically what you say is there's this thing that we can't observe called how much a student enjoys English. And we can't see that directly, but that thing will have various kinds of effects. There'll be all these indicators that are caused by the student's enjoyment, right? And then we can assess those and say, we can statistically adjust and say the only thing that would cause all of these is their enjoyment. So this sounds a bit complicated. I think if we just go on to the next slide. If we go on to the next slide, yeah, we should be able to see some of the actual items that were used. For example, we can ask students whether they agree studying English is enjoyable, one to five, and we ask them one to five, disagree to agree whether they look forward to their English classes right and so there was a whole there was a group of items like this for all of the different for all of the different constructs and the really nice thing about confirmatory factor analysis is that it is this might not sound like a nice thing but I think it's really important is that it is a failable test we have a theory that there's this one thing enjoyment that causes all these indicators and that makes specific predictions about what those indicators should do so specifically it should be that on average 
for example, students who say studying English is enjoyable shouldn't agree, shouldn't be happy when they get to miss English classes, right? If on average students that say English is enjoyable also agree that they're happy to miss English, then we think that there's some kind of problem with our test going on. And then we have to throw this out. It gets more complicated in this. There's actually a whole series of kind of statistical properties that you'd want from your measure in order to for it to be valid for us to use it in this way. And so remember, we had the three different outcomes, confidence, enjoyment, and then conception of English. And of those three, confidence and enjoyment both came out and the test had this nice statistical properties that we would expect. However, that third one, the conception of English, their conception of English as a whole, whether it was whether English is just about passing exams or whether English is about communicating with people, it didn't really exhibit that kind of property. It, there wasn't really the nice kind of spectrum that we expected. Sometimes people would, often people would say, yes, English is just about communicating with people. And yes, English is just about passing exams. So that kind of means that our scale didn't really make any sense. The problem, so we had to essentially throw that out. Now that could suggest something deep about students conceptualize English don't conceptualize these things as conflicting, conflicting ends of the spectrum. They have some complicated unified thing. But it could also just mean that we designed our items complicated, right? All these items were asked to the students in Arabic, but maybe we just worded it a little bit too complicated. Maybe sometimes you just have bad luck and they, things don't correlate in the right way for just ran, very random reasons. So we had to throw that out. Now that might tell us something, but it could also just be random. So we're left with just the two outcomes of those, which is enjoy how much students enjoy English and their confidence using it. So let's get into the results of the confidence. Also quickly, just for those of you that do are more focused on the kind of quant methods in research. So we extracted factor scores, which is essentially the scores before and after. And so we, we're trying to predict their score, their confidence after taking part, adjusting for their score before they took part. And then we're obviously they're in classes, which is clustering. So we use random effects in order to adjust for that, for those of you who are interested. And so the fact score regression, we also had to do adjustment in the way as described by Scrondel and Larker 2001 in order to make everything consistent statistically. I'm sure this is like complete uh, alien to a lot of you, but maybe some of you are like, oh, yes, that's fine. Yeah, so let's get into the actual results. If you can just show the graph. Yeah, so if we were to look at this, so on the, we have a similar type of graph as we saw earlier. So on the left, we have the girls classes, white again is the control classes and orange is the hands up classes. So as we can see from the beginning to the end, the control girls decreased in confidence over that time, whereas the hands up girls increased in confidence over that time. So the, so the control girls decreased by 0 0.25 points and the hands up girls increased by 0 0.25 points. So that's a difference of around half a point. So what does a point mean here? So obviously I've constructed the scale myself using all these different items that we created, just to give you a kind of sense of where the scale goes from. The biggest difference in confidence from out of all 350 students, from the person who is most confident speaking English to the person who is least confident speaking English is around 3.7 points difference. So in that context, a 0 0.5 change on average in the girls is actually would be quite large, I would think, right? If we were to look at the boys, then we have a similar kind of pattern, right, where the boys decreased um, in confidence over the period in the control group, but in the hands up group, they increased in confidence. A big question we get here, though, right? So if we could just go on to the next slide. So the hands up groups were indeed more confident than the control groups. But can we be certain that it was because of the hands up project, right? That's the, that's the big question. So we randomized assignment here. Um, but essentially, we could have just got lucky, right? There's two potential explanations for our data. So if you just click on once. So one option is the hands up project cause confidence to increase in students. That is straightforwardly clearly one. That's one scenario of the world that's consistent with the data that we've collected. If you just click on. The other option, though, is the hands up project has no effect at all. And we just got lucky through random chance. Right. That's totally possible as well. If you were to split eight classes into two groups of four, one of those groups of four is going to have a higher score than the other, just because, just from random anything, regardless of whether the hands up project had an impact or not. So now we can't directly, at least just using the data, calculate the probability that the hands up project caused confidence to increase. But we can ask how improbable is it to get data that looks like this just by random chance, right? So we can see if the if if the random chance theory is super improbable, then it's more likely that the hands up project caused confidence. So if you just to go on. So the probability of seeing a difference like this between the two groups just from pure chance, otherwise known as the p-value for some of you that are more into statistics, that's 0 0.21, which is like 20% or one in five. 
So you would get a difference as big as this approximately one in five times just from random chance. The, the standard cutoff in most of the social sciences is like a one in 20 chance. So I would say here, look, if you're going to put a gun to my head and be like, Andre, what do you personally believe? I would say it's it's more likely that the Hands Up project does cause confidence to increase, but we really can't be sure at this point. It's totally possible that we just got lucky on this, on these results. So if we could just move on. So now let's do the whole, we can play the whole game again with enjoyment and look at the difference in enjoyment. So if we're to look at the graph, so we have the graph structured in the same way. So the girls over the period, the control girls decrease their enjoyment of English as a whole by half a point and increased by half a point approximately in the hands up group and we have the same pattern where the boys showed the same trend but a much smaller effect again so this scale because the enjoyment scale is separate to the confidence scale so this is out of around six so the difference between girls is a one point difference out of a six point scale essentially and the boys is a much smaller difference out of a six point scale um yeah so if you could just go on yeah so we can so let's play the whole game again, right? So the hands up group enjoyed English classes more than the control group, but can we be certain it's because of the hands up project? It could be if you just go on because it caused it to go up, or it could be if you just go on. You, you're going to see where I'm going here, right? It could be that we just got lucky through random chance. So the key thing is, what's the probability of this happening just through random chance? And the probability of seeing a, a difference as large in enjoyment here from just from random chance is 0.2 of a percent. So that's one in 500. And that's the difference of seeing, that's the probability of seeing a difference. So the probability of specifically the hands up group having higher enjoyment than the control group, if we were to just set it specifically in that, is half of that. So that's a one in a thousand chance. So the probability of getting data like this with where the control group is does much worse than the experimental group just through random chance is super, super unlucky. So in this case, I'm very confident to say that the hands up project caused enjoyment to go up. So ironically, we can't be confident about confidence, but we can be confident about enjoyment. So here we have, I would say more uh, ro robust results. Um, so I wanna just touch on some kind of follow-up analyses that we, that we did following this. Now it's worth saying that everything we've done up to here has been quite clean, randomized controlled trial, very neat, very robust, I would say. And here we did some follow-up analyses to see who these worked for, but obviously we'll see as we get into it, that this is much less robust as a method of analysis, but I think it's still informative in a way. So one concern you could have about the Hands Up project is that sure, the Hands Up project makes students enjoy their classes more, but only if they're already like quite a high performing student. If they already have a high level of English, they can go in and talk at the front, they're going to get loads out of the sessions. But if they're really, if they're really, if they have a really low level, then going up talking in front of all their peers is not going to be, is not, that's going to, if anything, that could make it more stressful. That's not going to make it better. There's, if we can see the graph, yeah. So obviously there's some models underpinning this. So the thing that we're interested in, right, we have the pre-test quintile, which is how the students did on their tests before taking part. And five indicates the 20% of students that did best on the test. And one indicates the 20% of students that did worst on the test with all the other ones in between. And so what we're interested in is whether the difference between the control and the hands up group changes by where the student is in the quintile, right? So if, for example, the Hands Up project only works for really high performing students, then we'd see a, a big difference in quintile five and no difference or even a negative difference in quintile one. As you can see, that's not really what we see, right? In every single quintile, the Hands Up group does substantially better in terms of enjoyment than the control group. So that indicates that this seems to work and indeed, when we model it formally as well, there's no interaction, right? There's no interaction between it. it there's an, we, the evidence does not suggest that the Hands Up project works better for higher performing students than it does for lower performing students when we model it formally. There's a non-significant relationship there as well. So if we can move on, another concern that you might have is that during Hands Up sessions, uh, during a typical class, not everyone gets to go up to the front to actually speak on camera. And maybe the Hands Up project sessions are really valuable for the students that do go up on camera but not but it's a waste of time if you're just sat at the back watching someone else speak English um, so one way that we could try and look at that is we, we've we have for all the students that took part we've coded how many times they went up to the front and they actually interacted with the person on the camera now this wasn't randomly assigned so there's lots of potential methodological problems with this right but roughly speaking and I only mean this is a kind of suggestive analysis 
But if the hands up project only works for people that interacted, it should be that people who interacted lots had a really big increase in enjoyment and people that didn't interact at all had no change in enjoyment or even a negative change in enjoyment. So if we look at this graph on the X axis, that if you just go back a second, I'll just, yeah, never mind, never mind. Along the X axis, we have uh, the number of interactions. So on the left, we have zero which means students that interacted zero times, and on the far we have students that interacted lots of times. And on the y-axis, we have their change in enjoyment. And if the theory is true, what we'd expect is a vertical diagonal line going from the bottom left up to the top. So it should be that students that interacted loads had a big increase in enjoyment. So let's look at the actual data. Yeah, so this is what the data looks like. As you can see, there isn't that neat vertical line as we expect. And indeed, the more important thing is that when we model this formally as well, there's a non-significant relationship as well between the number of interactions and the change in enjoyment. But really crucially, if you look at it, remember in the control groups, on average, the control groups all decreased in enjoyment. Whereas if we look at the number of interactions here, students with zero interactions still increase their enjoyment by approximately 0 0.2 points, right? So again, this is not run, students were not randomly assigned to interact. There could be all all kinds of things going on here but so far the data that we've collected doesn't suggest that the hands up project only works for people the students that do interact that's a rough summary of all the of all the data i think that takes us to exactly 40 minutes so i'm quite pleased with that so i would like to i've got a couple of points uh, about the research which i found very interesting indeed and very well explained of course by andre there um, we could all follow along very nicely thank you um, and i wondered if there are two, two points I'd like to make about it. One is about the idea of a delayed post-test because of the fact that the children, especially with the group that are getting the intervention, they're excited by it and they're enjoying it and it's something new and novel. But how long does that effect last after the intervention stops? Which might give you some more evidence for your claims actually and the other one is about the whole idea of a control group with children what is your view of a control group you've got all these 350 kids all getting a, a lovely new experience and a control group of a similar size I presume not getting an experience and I wondered if there's any ethical issues around that you thought about or maybe you'd put something in place to counteract that. That's me. Not yeah, I, I'll just touch the second question first because that's in my mind. Yeah, it's the, it was really complicated. I'm a kind of research design person. I never have to worry about the, I never had to worry about the practical issues before. And I think it was really interesting. There was actually a point where one of the, one of the teachers felt that it was really unfair that the control group students weren't taking part so she like organized like a treat for them where it was like a professional sports person came in and they all got to interview a professional sports person just for the control classes as like a as a treat for them so it would be more fair which if anything would bias our enjoyment results downwards so the true effect would be larger but yeah i think that was really complicated if i remember correctly the control group got to take part in the intervention just after we stopped collecting data so from our perspective it was clean in that sense but definitely i imagine that if you were to actually interview the students some of them even though they'd been told that might have you know still been frustrated that their peers were doing something exciting when they had to wait however how many weeks to do it but yeah do you have anything else to add on that just to say that we were intending to do it the other way around again, weren't we? With the yeah. other group. And then because of complications in the, there's a shift system in Palestine where sometimes they're morning shift and sometimes they're afternoon shift. And it just became totally impractical to do that with the oh, same really? group. So we didn't actually do search. We, we were going to do the research with the, oh, same, yeah. with, with the second group, weren't we? But yeah, so that didn't happen in the end. But, Sorry, what was your first what was your first question as well? My first question was about whether you thought about doing a delayed post-test. Yeah, so that actually I think yeah, I think practically because of things that they've all restructured classes, so it wouldn't be possible. But there was actually a bit of a delay just in the test that we did, in that it was like the end of a semester essentially, is that right? And then they had a break and then came back and did it their first session back. So they'd already had it's only a few weeks break, I think, but still. It wasn't like the sessions were really fresh in their mind. I would expect the effect to decrease over time, but it's so hard to know a priori. We'd have to say a priori what that is, and we can't. No, I don't, yeah. Yes, um, I've taught in um, the 
so-called global south, also myself in Laos, uh, for many years now. And um, there are two significant differences, just so that you understand why I won't go into the methodology, because I realize that the settings are very different, because you teach online, and I was there on site with my students as volunteers teaching live in that area. So it doesn't really compare. But I thought the activities you used were really engaging and it was clear that they worked and your uh, research study was also um, robust and neat. <clears throat> I do have questions, if I can ask some decolonial questions next, or I don't know if you're comfortable with that. Please, yeah. Please, first of all, we are re-examining vocabulary, particularly in the English language. So why would you call or we call it a low resource teaching environment? This is low resource from our perspective because we think that high means books and tech. And I would argue after my experience in Laos that it can also be a high resource context if you use toys and your body. And there is no better toy than the English language, as far as I'm concerned. So if you turn English into a toy, let the children play with it, you've got a high resource classroom. So this is the one annotation. I don't know if you agree with this. Do we really need books and technology? Do we try to improve course books or don't we do the real teaching alongside because the course books is what is tested by the local authorities. So you have to teach it. So my, my suggestion would be get through it as quickly and possible as possible, do what you have to do because of the test situation, and then use the time you've gained for your wonderful activities and increasing enjoyment. I wondered also, what were your goals as teachers from the Global North coming in there online for a limited period of time? So what were the tandem or teaching cooperation teachers' goals where does it all lead or what was it all for or what's the outcome where does it go next because we're not in a vacuum yeah so i'd like to look beyond if you yeah. care to share brilliant okay lots of points there just going back to the yes brilliant thank you so much for making that point about high what is low resource and what is high resource i would say yeah you're completely right um in many ways gaza Classrooms in Gaza are a very high resource environment because you have very high motivation, very high willingness to learn and, and a place where ed education is very highly valued. So that's comparing it to some contexts in Europe that I could mention. There's a big difference there. I've made a, I've, there's so many points in your question. Um, the other yeah, I would also was, argue that in Western classrooms, we are very low resource on student motivation, right? Yeah, exactly. And discipline. And these are things I don't uh, face when I teach in Laos. It's so yeah. easy. Yeah. Yeah, so, but what you said. Yeah, so just going back to the end, your point at the end, the idea with this is we've been going through a bit of a transition in the Hands Up project. We've ten This is a bit of a change for us to work with whole classes in the government sector, which the classes in governmental schools are bigger than they are in the UN schools. They're quite big in UN schools. They're 40 students, but in the governmental schools, it's 50. So we've, and we've also tended to work with more motivated students and done link-ups with kind of smaller groups of motivated students whose level of English is already quite high. So we're quite interested in moving towards working with whole groups, situating it in the classroom. And so we were quite excited about the results of this research. I was actually supposed to be in Gaza now or just would have just come back recently. And I was going to be taking 15 projectors to give mm -hmm. to the ministry schools because we wanted to roll this out to lots of different schools and work with different grades. We worked only with grade uh, eight with this. We wanted to work with grade seven and grade nine as well. The impact that one projector can have in a school is quite big because it's a number, a lot of teachers can use that. It can be moved around, it's chargeable. So it doesn't need to have electricity. It can have a three hour charge. And I would say 
I've so you were you, you already planned the sustainability of this one try, let's say this was the first try to see if it could be made sustainable. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Because often I've seen a lot of projects, the FIFOs flying in, flying out for two weeks or four weeks, and then everything just like a souffle falls back on itself after they leave because it's not sustainable. So I'm just wondering. Yeah. But definitely. you're doing it. So or you would have done it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I hope I still hope that we will be able to do that at some point. Mm -hmm. We will be able to go back and implement this in more schools. Yeah. I was also supposed to be in Israel four weeks ago. So I know what you're talking about and what it means for the partners. OK, thank you so very much, Nick and Andre, for this interesting story. I listened to it with a lot of attention and I was so soaked up in it because I happen to have done some experimental designs on a micro longitudinal basis. And I'm so concerned with, also interested in Isabel's approach towards sustainability, how the delete test, whether the effect of the delete test could be sustainable. But one interesting thing that I found with the study, the, the whole study is super interesting, but what catches my attention more is that Although um, Andrea was so uh, modest in his language, probably, but I found that there was a significant effect of the every design because one something happened because of the pedagogic, because of the orientation of your study, something happened. There was a change. There was motivation. There was enjoyment. But w one of the things which we didn't get was what was the default state before this pedagogic intervention, um, how did we scale up, follow up, to be sure that it wasn't more of the pedagogic medium that correlated with the incidences or with the change. The other thing I'd like us to look at is this design is not the default pedagogic medium of instruction in Gaza. Um, maybe you want to tell us why you decided to use only this medium. Okay, the other issues I'd like us to reflect on is we hold the classes to be large and this comes back to Isabel's worry about who defines whether a class is large or small, whether the resources are low or high. Did anything happen? Yes, there was change in the design. And what was the class size? Okay, it wasn't 30, it wasn't 20. If things can happen in a class of 50, is it necessary going for us to call the class large? That's the other thing I would like us to reflect on. Overall, I think there is a lot more evidence in your study demonstrating that that change of approach and not always using the routine which the uh, students are used to can be a take-home message. We can use something like that as a way of building motivation and enjoyment. For the moment, I can stop here. Um, I have a few more questions, but probably in the second term, um, Marisol, thank you so much. Sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. Yes. That's the short answer, but I, I, I assume, yeah, it was quite a short period of time, really. It was only eight weeks that we did the intervention for. I. Yeah, I would assume it would. Yeah, I think that's true. And in a way, those are the results that I'm most excited about in terms of hands up, that the, that the test results didn't go down. Because I think often it, it's suggested by the supervisors or education specialists in Palestine that we can't do these sessions in the normal classes because students have to focus on the exam. Perhaps we weren't preparing them for the exam. 
by doing these. We weren't helping them to pass the exam, to get better results in the exam. But the fact that we, their results didn't go down shows at least <laughs> that it, it there's maybe something useful going on in the sessions and maybe something that's giving them a, a, a love of English and, and a, a, an enjoyment of English classes is arguably more valuable than, than test results in the short term. Sure. The other thing is that, sorry, I just to cut off, is that kind of linking these questions together is that I'd be really, the study that we couldn't do because it would take too long, that really I think would have been really interesting, is if this had been able to go for long enough, does the effect in motivation affect their test scores eventually, right? Because that's what I would hope is that their their change in motivation would maybe over eight weeks being a more motivated student isn't going to make a big difference on your exam. But I would, I would hope that a year or two later, even if the exam is only focusing on grammar and vocabulary and they're excited about English because it allows them to communicate, that, that the, the exam is a really noisy measure, but it would the dream would be that it still picks up on that now obviously we don't know that right we don't know we couldn't do yeah. a two-year study but that I, I, i'm sorry for coming in i think there is evidence yeah. um demonstrating that because they're interested in what they're doing then the grammar and the vocabulary comes up uh, spontaneously and that and that to say because we don't have test results to demonstrate that to me doesn't really make sense because there's a lot of evidence demonstrating that if they are interested in what they're doing then definitely the grammar and the vocabulary is going to come up in incidentally and organically because there is no argument there is oh hey, sorry hey, eric i think you just went on mute oh. so i think this way it's better just gonna ask sorry that sorry to interrupt you there um marisol but i was just wondering if we could bring in we've got saha who is a teacher trainer in hebron i believe who's asking if she can speak and i wonder if i can I don't know if I can do that on a webinar. Ah, there she is. Yes. There we go. There we go. Can you, there you are, Sahar. Welcome. Welcome to the session. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. We hear you. Yes. I. First of all, I would like to appreciate all the things that, that you did for us as teachers and for our students in West Bank and also in Gaza. You did great things for us. But what I want to say to you, Nick, if you don't do anything soon, there will be no students to work with anymore. I think you new Palestinians, you work with them. You should do something. Yeah, you should do something. Nick. They are they barely kill innocent people, innocent children. If you go back to Gaza, you will never find them. <laughs> all the world is watching. All the world doing nothing. Innocent children are being killed. Our students are no more there. The students that you worked with, they are dead. Nick, please tell the world what are the Palestinians. You know the, them very well. You lived with them. You know them very well. We Thank were, you. Thank you, Saha. We... You will never have students to work with, Nick. Please tell the world that we are victims. We are suffering. Our, our students now are in... Outside their home, they are homeless. Nothing to eat, no electricity, under the rain, no shelters. They are innocent, you know them. They are brilliant students. They are being selfish in a selfish way. I want to just say thank you, Sahar, for bringing that up. I want to say that all of us in the Hands Up Project are with you and we support, we're doing what we can to support this dire situation. Nick, you and know the Palestinians, many... you know the Gazan people, you know them, you lived with them. Are yes. they brutal? Are they terrorists? Tell the word, please. We're doing what we can, Sahar. We are all doing what we can to support the situation. 
I know you do. I know your support. But we want actions, not words. We want actions. You will never have, and your students are not there. Most of them are dead now. <laughs> Thank you, Sahar. Thank you for Thank saying. You. I'm um, sorry, but I can't. I can't be here anymore. I can't. I can't. I can't stand without saying anything. Why seeing the children killed in this way? They are, we are not terrorists. We want to live. We want life. We want our land. We want to live like other people. We, we are teachers. Mm -hmm. And we want to. We spread education all over the world, the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. But now we are terrorists. Are we terrorists, Nick? Are we? Look, Saha, we know what you're saying. We stand in all of us in the Hands Up Project, stand in solidarity with you. And we are doing what we can to, to support your, the students of Palestine and the teachers of Palestine and education in Palestine. Thank, Thank you, Nick. Yeah, I felt so emotional with what the lady was saying because um, this is really, this is really concerns global issues. And yes. we aren't going to function as a SIG if we are not making clear statements and taking government into state, into in, causing government to be responsible. I understand that we are not part of this. Uh, we didn't create this war or we didn't create the tension around the world. This is a capitalist design and all of us are victims. Today it's Gaza, T today it's Cameroon, to tomorrow it may be this. And the other part of it, the most intriguing, I'm sorry that we're shifting away from the hands of project, but this concerns are sick. I'm sorry to say this here. If we don't start making clear statements and engaging public actors, because they are responsible for this, and then at a certain point, we may find our work useless because there's no point talking about students who are dead. Yes, sir. Yep. In my own, this is my position. There's no point talking about position, about children who are dead. So is there a possibility for us to start reflecting on ways through which we can hold governments down? Because this is the crisis that has been generated. These are crises generated by modern states. And the actors are there. They are not the one dying. They are not the one fighting. They recruit our own children to go fight and kill other children who are less uh, who are vulnerable. There's, if there is a way through which we can make public statements and even engage public actors into this, it's important because it's, at a certain point, we will find if we find, if we found, if we had five sa online here now, this session will not go through. And we are moving towards that area. Uh, we're mo moving towards that point. So I'm sorry that I deviated a bit from this because it's a kind of, it's a very painful situation because I'm equally affected by this. I've lived this experience. My family fled from home because of a senseless war. And I can't go back to my village to go and clean the graves of my parents for the past seven years because the big powers, the big guys steer the wheel. It's such a shameful thing. I'm sorry to say this. Maybe I can just say that I had ethical doubts about attending or agreeing to come to the panel in the current situation because there's obviously this elephant in the room and I asked whether we would address it. And um, I was told that the meeting was not to be political in any way whatsoever. And I think that's the problem because there is no research in a non-political environment. It's heavily political. You just choose to stay in your silo if you say that it's not political is my attitude. So maybe the question that would interest me next is what does it mean to teach English in a non-democratic militaristic environment? Do we have to contribute anything to that from the global north? Because we live in peace and we have not the first idea about this. And since the war started six weeks ago, 5,000 Palestinian children were killed. That's how I did the math, 111 every day. And today's World Children's Day. I'm glad we did finally talk about it. I would thank you also, particularly to Sahar. You must be going through hell. 
have very little to add to that or to what Eric has said and to listening to our colleague in Palestine. I think I agree that no research is apolitical. It's impossible to do research that's apolitical. I think we all need to look at ourselves and challenge ourselves when we do research about what we're really doing and, and where we're trying to go. But I think we also need to recognise that Nick and the Hands Up Project have been working for years and years in Palestine and have been doing amazing work when people were not looking in that direction. And I think that's the spirit in which this seminar was held. Yeah, with all those, all the thoughts of everybody else, I'm in agreement.